to somebody calling and they give some details in their message, um, personal things, but they say they just moved here from New York. I grew up Catholic but have lost my way and the teaching has really resonated with me. Now, I want to talk about that for a minute because I think there are a lot of people who, who get, they don't get me or they misunderstand me when I have talked about Catholicism and <clears throat> first of all it is a gross mistake to put all of Catholicism in one ball and I say that because exposure to a diversity of we'll call them subcategories within even though unlike Protestants who, you've got a bifurcation of the term, more than a bifurcation, and Baptists, and you've got all these, you know, Lutheran, but for most people, a Catholic is a Catholic, and we tend to kind of put this global name on it. But the reality is not all Catholics believe the same way. And that kind of sounds a little bit weird, but that's a true statement. Um, <clears throat> there are Catholics that have a leaning towards a more charismatic. Well, there's people who are accustomed to going into the Catholic Church and thinking that the Catholic Church is this very cut and dry, but there is a branch of Catholicism that is charismatic. And then within the different groups, you'll find that there are people who are actually outside of the traditional Roman Catholic faith. I'm telling you this for a reason that are not um, praying and worshiping Mary. They are part of, we'll call it, a, a more Bible-structured environment. <clears throat> and then you've got what I came out of, which is blind Catholicism. You don't need a book. You don't need a Bible. If you get anything, get a card. Here's some beads. Go home. Be happy. And you better be at Mass and go to confession. But people get me all wrong, and I've kind of used the term, I you know, Catholic Catholicism, but the reality is that when I talk about this subject, there's actually pain for me. It's painful for me because having spent the time that I spent and not having learned anything is wasted. I'm talking about the years that I was in the church. It's wasted. And I wasn't in the church a long time, still wasted. And I have some friends that are Catholic, and my question is always, oh, if they're going to go to Mass, what'd you learn at Mass? And there's never, there's never any, anything of substance. There's, there's no it may be a scripture reading and then it takes off on some social issue and, and it's a lot of social justice or injustice issues which quite frankly you know what if we'd stick to the Bible instead of going off on your own narrative we might actually learn God's going to take care of the injustices eventually but I don't make comments without having some consideration that I really believe when people that have been in the Catholic Church get um, illuminated by the scripture and the opening up of the scripture, Catholics make some of the best converts to the faith. And I'm not saying that they're void of faith. I'm just saying of people who are not looking for the, the we're not going for ceremony and the garb and the regalia. We're going for what do I know about God from this book? They make some of the best converts. And the tragedy is, as I said, I've got plenty of people around me who are wonderful people. I, I have affection for them in the Lord, of course, but they, they're, they're not in the Lord necessarily. But go to the church and you ask them the question. They, they, can't, they can't tell you anything more than, actually, I've, in the last six months, I met one individual, 
uh, who actually is the, the father of a friend of mine. And uh, he's Catholic, but man, he's got, it, he's got it so right. You know, we were having a conversation, um, not once, nothing came up except you have to be faithing and trusting Christ. And I thought, okay, there's hope. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm trying to say I have compassion and understanding because when we are a part of something, especially if you've grown up in a religious institution like the Catholic Church, you grow up only knowing that, and that is, that's the family way, that's the cultural way. There are certain things that you're grooved into automatically and you don't know any better. And you think you are in something that is the one true faith. It's only the one true faith if you're learning what's in this book and you're trusting Christ. That's when it's the one true faith because you can say you know who God is. This is life eternal that they may know the one true living God and His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He has sent. You can't get to know Him any other way. Sorry, it's not by feeling. It's not by, you know, mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. You've got to, you've got to know Him through the book. So, um, I know that a lot of, there's probably a lot of people that get offended when I say those things. And as I said, it's, it's design is not to offend. It's design is to say, you're missing out. And I'm, I can speak as someone who missed out for many years. And I, I just wonder, I, mean, I know it's all in God's time, God had it all planned out, but what would it have been had I known earlier? What would it have been, you know, would my, I, and I really believe my life would be different, of course, a different course of things. I don't necessarily, so I don't want to change anything, okay? But I'm just saying it still is painful because those years that I would call years of darkness for me, well, you have nothing to hold on to. And um, maybe this is also a sensitive spot for me because I can, when we talk about, for example, Christmas, I've said to you, Christmas as celebrated on December 25th, um, Christmas I've always said, you know, use that as an excuse to be affectionate to people that, you know, people tend to be a little bit the angry, mean people tend to be a little bit more kind during that time of year. Use that to your benefit to just be loving and get together and whatever. Don't, don't put any spiritual halo on it. But Easter is a time to understand what the church is about, especially for people who are not in the faith or don't understand the faith. And this last week I encountered more craziness I mean, like I said, from my dear friend who, you know, are you doing anything fun at the church? And I'm thinking, good. I mean, you know, I, that's a friend of mine. I, I want to say, you know, did somebody drop you on your head? <clears throat> I, I mean, you know, in, really? I had somebody else ask me, you know, what do you do for the children for Easter? And I, but I had a lot of good thoughts going through my head. <laughs> but I did something. I said, well, we, we put them on a bus and we send them away. <laughs> <laughs> Where to send them? I don't know. <laughs> of course, I later explained, which was kind of funny, but uh, it just, you know, I, I understand. Listen, some of you who are parents, you take your kids out to the store and they manage those, those tricky store people manage to put all the chocolate eggs and the bunny rabbits right at perfect eye level for your kid. Like, ah! Right? They don't understand. It says Easter egg or Easter bunny or whatever. I get it. But there's also the goodness of trying to, you know, explain early on that this is, if there is a, a day above any other day, which... I mean, I, like I said, I think we celebrate Easter every Sunday and throughout the week, but if there is a day above every, any day, it is Easter. Because if he didn't come out of the tomb, we're just a bunch of dummies. And it's really sad to see 
that there is no, there's no real substance, not even for children, that could have some uh, exposure if the parents knew what the meaning of Easter is. But if the parents are wrapped up in traditions and all the craziness, the kids aren't going to know. So um, <clears throat> it's just been an interesting week for me. It's like, you know, you, most of you witnessed the, I'm sure everybody saw the footage of the cathedral, Notre Dame Cathedral burning. And of course, the, the first thing they want to say is, you know, they, well, they rescued the, the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. And I just have to, like, go, stop. Now, somebody might think I'm being blasphemous, but let me, let me tell it from my perspective. My perspective is, one, when Joseph Arimathea went to Pilate to beg for the body of Jesus, and it was granted to him, do you really think that a Jew, part of the Sanhedrin, and Nicodemus is with him. Do you really think that they would say, let's keep the crown? That'll be worth something one day. <laughs> it was a mockery. It was blasphemy. It was a mockery. It was, it was a vile thing. I imagine when they took him off the cross, if it didn't fall off of his head, but they most certainly removed it at some point when they buried him. And believe me, based on what can be known of Jewish traditions and rituals, I highly doubt that they kept it. Do you really think that anybody in the, in the current theme of that moment, because no one anticipated Jesus actually raising up from the dead because they believed in the, the last day wh where he would be raised up, that's what they thought he was speaking of. There'd be no reason to keep any of these things. But certainly for a Jew where this is an item of ridicule, do you really think you'd save it? Furthermore, let's just take this another step further because I love all this stuff just as like, come on, bring it on. We have this kind of crazy idea of how they might have applied the spices to the body and people think of how the body might have been wrapped. There's actually a procedure of the way they prepared, washed, cleansed, and prepared the body for burial. And one of those was purification and removal of any item, any item, that would have been deemed to be unclean, unclean by the law, and unclean as in cleanliness unclean. So you know he wasn't buried with that crown. So let me get this straight. Somebody finds a crown somewhere and says, this is the one that Jesus, this, this belonged to Jesus, and let's, let's, um, encase it, let's wrap it in gold or whatever, and let's encase it. You know, a lot of these things are, are never discussed like this because, it's, you know, because when people don't know the history of the Reformation, it is what made the church, the Catholic Church, money during the period where people went and they did their veneration, worship, of those items and paid to see them as, as well as indulgences. Go see the finger of St. John the Divine, a lock of hair from John the Baptist. Really? But this is the problem where people get wrapped up in this, uh, what they can see. And, you know, it's all of these holy places and holy relics where people are kissing, you know, they're kissing the statuary and they're kissing the feet and they're kissing this. And you got one guy who's got a, the same wipe. A thousand different people put their mouth there and he just goes, <laughs> and like, I'm good. <laughs> I'd be doing this, <laughs> not that. But there is the item that's worship. You know, I really believe this is why we can take clues from the Bible. Why Moses' body, okay? Moses is now, you know, we have, we know the whole picture, but why Moses' body? We read about the wrestling over the fighting over the body of Moses. 
I believe had the body been left somewhere where people could go and venerate, God knowing our frame, just like Elijah, people would have gone to worship the spot. What do they do? What do they do now with places of notoriety, of biblical notoriety? They go and they worship there. We're not supposed to worship that. So this is almost like, you know, you can almost look at that and say, well, that's why, you know, <laughs> that's why I, the chances of these items being authentic and even if they were, what does it matter? And furthermore, the whole world got to see this thing that's, that was taken out of the church. Do you think that anybody came to the faith by seeing that, or they rescued this thing and they brought it out as the crown of thorns? Do you think anybody went, oh, I didn't know that was there. Oh, my goodness. Do you think anybody came to the faith because of that? I'm not saying it's impossible. There are people that they have to see something. But the likelihood of that. And then again, it's, it's placed on the seen and not the unseen. So all I have to say is there's a lot of things that, you know, the Bible, you can search and say the wisdom of things that are contained therein, including the things that are not said, but you can take a page out and say that's why when people talk about where's the ark. You know, and I've referred to this many times before. Well, you know, people, some people say that the Ethiopian Jews, uh, they have the ark. There's other people that claim they have the ark. And the ark is guarded and, you know, I'm, who knows? But the fact of the matter is I think God knows that if the ark was, if it was really made known that that was truly the ark, don't, I think there would probably be people who would go and worship at the ark. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want to split the worship anywhere. He, want, he wants us to worship Him, not some divided pathway to get to Him. So um, all I'm saying to you is there's plenty of things, plenty of goodies if I wanted to defend the faith in a different way uh, that I could definitely do through science, there's just, there's so much in the Old Testament, especially, that I could just keep checking off the boxes. Now, is that going to do anything for anybody who is closed, completely closed off, and is part of the soil that cannot receive? No. But I will have done my part in putting the information out there. And maybe it won't help that individual, but it may be for somebody else who God says, that's good soil, the seed will take there. It's not my business to know, but it is my business to keep putting the information out there, and that's what I will keep doing. In the meantime, I hope you will keep getting on the telephone and making your reservation. Get busy. <laughs>